The Little Mermaid. It's a really beautiful story. It's an amazing movie. Show of hands. Who loves that movie? The Little Mermaid. Just show of hands. Okay. Um, show of hands. Who, like, relishes the original 1989 version of The Little Mermaid? Just show of hands. Okay. And, you know, there was a remake this year. Who, who loved the remake? Just show of hands. Okay. Um, the Barbie movie. Who saw that? Who saw the Barbie movie? Yeah, it actually got us back into the theaters, Barbie. And then on that same day that Barbie opened, Oppenheimer opened. Who saw? Yeah. Um, we're in interesting times. So the um, Little Mermaid 1989 crew, raise your hand again. So you're telling me you're a white supremacist. That's, that's what you're telling me. The Little Mermaid 2023 crew. Raise your hands, the ones who prefer that. Oh, so you're telling me you're part of the woke mob and you're erasing the accurate history of mermaid Americans with that facsimile fake brown mermaid, right? Um, Barbie folks. Barbie folks, okay, so you hate men. You, well, some people are like, yeah, that's actually true, I do. Um, Oppenheimer people, oh, so you're comfortable with erasing the stories of indigenous people, of committing to the war machine, of just like advancing US empire. Yep, it's obvious, that's how I knew. So today we're in very unclear times. October 7th, as a human, as a father, as a person with a beating heart, I felt deeply, deep empathy for the people who either lost family members or remained or today are held captive. Um, and I see a direct line and no contradiction and no false choice between feeling that deep empathy for those folks in Israel and feeling deep empathy for the more than 2 million everyday people in Gaza who are sheltering and without water and electricity and food and I went on the internet and I shared the fact that I saw no contradiction and a direct moral and ethical line between my empathy for both communities. And I learned very quickly, like within minutes, that I hated Jews, um, I hated America, and that I supported terrorists. We're in a moment where every decision you make, every position you take, from the most pedestrian decisions, like what movie you might want to watch on a Friday, to how you might opine on a much more nuanced and complicated situation like conflicts a world away, locks you into some sort of binary tribal camp. Um, there's no way to make, it seems, any decision or to have any proclivity or to communicate in any way in public without somehow signing up for one team or another. What do we, what do, we do with that? Like, and more importantly, what the hell is happening? You know, I have an idea of what might be happening. More than 40 years of neoliberalism, years under a pandemic, systems that are decaying and dying around us without any hope of new systems taking their place. A lot of us, a lot of 
folks in this room, I don't want to speak for anybody, but certainly a lot of everyday people around the world are feeling a deep sense of alienation, of isolation, of loneliness, of depression, are feeling physically and economically insecure. In a rapidly changing world, are feeling unmoored. So it makes sense that people who are feeling unmoored and are feeling a lack of safety and a lack of connection are reaching for any semblance of safety and connection they could find. And people are reaching for the thin, the thin safety of safe silos. People are reaching for the undeveloped but very powerful connection and solidarity of nationalism. People are reaching for maybe easy, unnuanced, black and white, tribal solutions to very troubling and real problem. And they're finding it. I want to give you an example from my, from my life. Can I tell you a little story about my life? OK. Um, it involves avocados, so just want to prepare you. Um, so I, um, I'm one of a number of people who were on the ground in the very early days and weeks in Ferguson, Missouri, after the death of Michael Brown. And I had the honor of supporting many of the young people that hit the streets and operated with incredible bravery and um, started something that has changed the entire world. Um, and we have a, a debt of gratitude to those young people and to those everyday working class people who really uh, stood up for their human rights. And as part of that movement, I would walk into tear gas and rubber bullets. I would walk into and go to communities in Baltimore and Charleston and again and again and again where there's deep suffering and mourning because a community member was killed um, and people are trying to pick up the pieces. And over a while, and I didn't realize it initially, I developed some symptoms of PTSD and I developed some anxiety. And if anybody has experienced anxiety, you know that it feels like pain. And that anxiety slowly crept up and began to wrap itself around my body and my mind. And I found myself under my covers, unwilling to leave the safety of my blanket. Um, not wanting to leave my bed and feeling completely disconnected, completely alone. And my partner at the time pushed me and cajoled me and organized me to get out of bed, to put some clothes on and go to the grocery store. So we go to the grocery store and we're living in Southern California. And so if anybody knows, like, the variety and the quality of avocados in California are, are only rivaled that by perhaps the avocados in Mexico proper. And some might even argue, well, that's because California is Mexico, but that's not the topic of this, <laughs> of this conversation. And so we get, to the, we get to the grocery and there's a display of avocados. And in my very anxious mind, the variety of avocados is aggressive, is violent. And I'm so overwhelmed by how many avocados, how many different types of avocados that I break down and I retreat to the car, I lock the doors and I start crying uncontrollably. And I reach for my phone and I dial my brother who almost never picks up and he picked up on the first ring. And we go through our pleasantries and then finally he says, bro, how are you doing? And I, I, I'm able to just like reach in and get out, I'm not okay. That's the first time I said that. I, I admitted that I wasn't okay to somebody. And you know what he said? He said, of course, bro. He didn't try to make it better. He didn't try to prescribe anything. He just bore witness to my suffering. He chose to bear witness to my suffering. And then the waterworks turned on again. But there were different tears. There were tears that 
allowed me to feel seen. I felt seen again. And I was realizing that I was disappearing into my deep anxiety. And then from him bearing witness to me, I began to pull out of my anxiety and began to get reconnected. And why do I tell that story? Well, today I lead a political movement. I lead this thing called the Working Families Party, where every day we seek to, we believe the crazy idea that in a democracy, everyday people should govern and not corporations and the wealthy. I know it's a radical idea. <laughs> uh -huh. and, and so we seek to do that. And I want to be clear, this, is, this story is about nuance. Um, and, and the topic is nuance. Um, and we have very particular points of view. I'm not in the mushy middle. But in order to engage every day, I believe that that idea should be common. It should be common sense. It should be very popular. In order to engage people popularly, I got to meet people where they're at. And you know what I've learned through my journey as an organizer? People in communities do not look like the facsimile of America that we see on 24-hour TV. They don't. Um, if you watch 24-hour TV, you might be of the belief that in America, there are two tribes, one's progressive, one's conservative. One half identifies as Republicans, the other half identifies as Democrats. What I know is that people are ideologically incoherent, that most people have some views that you would consider progressive and some other views that you might consider conservative. That's where most people are. Most people aren't thinking about whether or not they fit into any ideological priors. Most people are just trying to survive. Like most human beings on the planet, most of the things that they're thinking about have to do with basic survival, right? And then some people actually get to, get to imagine how to thrive. That's where most people are at. And so as an organizer and as somebody that's interested in every, everyday people governing, I have to meet people where they're at. I have to be curious. And where are people? People are in the mud, the gray area. That's where people live. We got to be in the mud. That's where nuance is. The mud isn't pretty, but the mud is beautiful. The mud is complex. The mud is exciting. Nuance is exciting. The, the, there's a safety and a pristine and pretty silo of the perfect binaries that so many of us want to live in because of how chaotic and how volatile this world is. I can't promise you that the mud won't be volatile, but I can promise you it will be interesting. And so I choose to be in the mud. And what's, in, what's actually fascinating, and this is how this story doesn't necessarily have ideologies, I actually find that my friends in the political right, you know, often engage in the mud in ways that I wish that some of my friends would, right? Um, because being in the mud means being curious, and when you hear things, and maybe things that you might disagree with, you don't push people away. And you create an opportunity for connection. And I'll give an example. The Proud Boys is a multiracial white supremacist organization. Straight up. Like, the leaders include a very popular Afro-Cuban man that is engaging in propagating a ethno-nationalist ideology. And you might think, like, those contradictions just can't hold. But inside that organization, what are they providing? They're providing connection. They're providing meaning. They're providing a brotherhood. In a society where we become deeply disconnected, and if you had to describe the spiritual with one word, I would argue that the spiritual could be described in all types of language, but one way that the spiritual could be described as is connection. People are looking for spiritual homes. People are look, looking for connection. And if the only outlet is the Proud Boys, then that at least deals with this deep human need. Another thing is that there is a deep human need for dignity. And so many everyday people have, feel, have felt that their dignity has been taken from them, right? 
This economy has been gutted out. Everyday people feel betrayed and left behind by fair trade deals that have wrecked whole economies all over this country. And the movements that speak to restore dignity are talking about a real need. So many of my friends um, on the political left who I love focus on material change and policies that are really important. Like, I care about material change. I want to make sure that people have better health care, uh, that people you know, have a great living wage and all those things. And we need to address material needs. But if we don't address people's psychic needs, then we will lose them. We will lose them to despair. And we might lose them to ethno-nationalism and political violence and a total de decay and breakdown of our nation. And so how do we speak for the deep psychic need of dignity? And how do we recognize that our job isn't to educate people, our job is to connect people. And inside of those connective forces, inside of those connective organizations, then we could be in a dialogue. And we can learn together and struggle together. That connective place in the mud, that is where we operationalize nuance. It doesn't mean some mushy middle, but it means a place that we can learn and exchange and wrestle with one another. So I want to talk a little bit about how that is showing up today. Last Friday, and I want to reach into my body as I, as I recall this. Last Friday, in the midst of everything that's going on, and if you watch the discourse online and on TV, then you might be of the opinion that this is a binary fight. And as it relates to Israel and Palestine, you have to choose sides and you have to choose which side is more valid and therefore which side must you dehumanize. And there's people doing that. Um, and engaging in that discourse of dehumanization. I got on stage, uh, not too far from here in DC, at a rally. It was a multi-generational, multi-racial, multi-ethnic, multi-faith rally, where our message was fighting for the preservation of, of, of as much life as possible, where there were Muslims, Christians, Jewish folks, Black folks, white folks, Latino folks, Asians, folks of every generation speaking from the same consistent place of preserving human life. It was beautiful. It was complex. It was nuanced. It was messy. It wasn't pretty, but it was beautiful. And so I ask you, just like we did in Friday, so those of you who live in D.C., Friday was raining. So literally, after the rally, we marched. And as we marched, it got messy. It got muddy. It got gray. And we connected in that place. And in that connection, all of the anxiety-producing conversations around war and politics and dehumanization fell by the wayside. And we were inside a deeply humane and human space, the space of nuance, the space of connection in the mud. So I ask you if you will join me together in the mud. It won't be beautiful. It will be beautiful. It won't be pretty. I can't assure you victory, but I can assure you that ultimately in that mud, we'll discover creativity, we'll discover ecstasy. And in this limited time that we have on this on this planet, we'll find deep connection. Thank you.